I think to George Shultz, the Cold War was a problem to solve. Uh, and he approached it in a very deliberate, calm, reasonable way. Uh, and I think those were the factors that uh, allowed him to be so successful. That's the voice of Philip Taubman, journalist and author, as well as lecturer at the Stanford University Center for International Security and Cooperation. He's today's guest on Press the Button, a Plowshares Fund podcast dedicated to nuclear policy and national security. And now, here are your co-hosts, Michelle Dover and Tom Kalina. Welcome back to Press the Button. Before we get into today's episode, we wanted to mark the passing of Mike Elliman, who died this weekend following his longtime battle with cancer. Mark was a missile expert at the International Institute for Strategic Studies and a friend to many in this community. I know I am really going to miss his kindness and generosity, um, especially his generosity of time, which he shared even with those he didn't know well. We send our heartfelt condolences to his family and friends. Thanks for that, Michelle. And um, I share my condolences to his family and friends as well. Mike was a, was a special guy and we will miss him. Uh, now getting into today's show, uh, Michelle, what do you have lined up for early warning? Today, we're talking about the latest news out of Iran, including the successful negotiation between the International Atomic Energy Agency and Iran around a February 23rd deadline that would limit some inspector access. Find out what the United States is doing and could be doing to rejoin the JCPOA on today's early warning. And after that, I sit down with veteran New York Times journalist and George Schultz biographer, Phil Taubman to discuss the legacy of Ronald Reagan's late Secretary of State, including his underrecognized efforts to wind down the Cold War and abolish nuclear weapons entirely. It's a great conversation, so stay with us. Finally, Tom answers a question about the domino theory and Iran on this week's Q&A segment. If you want your question answered on the air, shoot us a DM at press button pod or send us an email at press the button at plowshares.org. And if you like what you hear, please hit subscribe and leave us a rating. Every little bit helps us grow our show and our audience, and we really appreciate it. With that, let's get into today's episode. The clock is ticking. And now, early warning. Early warning. Early warning. Early warning. A seven-minute synopsis of this week's nuclear news. Thanks, Dal. Today, I'm joined by Kelsey Davenport, Director for Nonproliferation Policy at the Arms Control Association. Kelsey, thank you so much for coming on. Thanks so much for having me. It's great to be on Press the Button. As you know, we have seven minutes to cover the week's nuclear news, and our time starts now. So as we've talked about on the show before, the Iranian parliament passed a law last year mandating that Iran stop implementing certain verification activities after February 23rd if the United States hadn't returned to the JCPOA. Obviously, that has not happened, and now we are facing that deadline. Um, so this past weekend, the IAEA director, Rafael Grossi, announced that Iran and the IEA had reached a temporary technical agreement to ensure that some of these nuclear verification and monitoring activities continue, though Iran will no longer be implementing the full range of them as before. So what does this mean for our understanding of Iran's nuclear activities? Well, the agreement that Iran and the IAEA reached yesterday is critical for preserving space to restore the JCPOA. I mean, had Iran gone through with its threat to fully cut off the additional protocol and the JCPOA specific monitoring mechanisms, it would have resulted in significantly less access for IAEA inspectors, and it would have given the agency significantly less information about Iran's nuclear program. So that would drive speculation that Iran was in 
engaged in illicit activities during this period while, while monitoring was reduced. Now, we don't have a lot of details about this technical agreement. And for reasons of confidentiality, the IAEA does not disclose much about how it applies safeguards. But it appears that Iran will continue to collect certain information, including continuous surveillance on video at key sites, and then turn that information over to the IAEA if sanctions relief is granted you know, by the end of this three-month period for the agreement. And what this will do is provide the IAEA with important information to reconstruct Iran's activities during the period uh, when the additional protocol and these other monitoring mechanisms were suspended. So it will help ensure that there's a continuity of knowledge about what Iran has undertaken and help the IAEA determine you know, whether or not Iran has diverted uh, any key technologies relevant to its nuclear activities through this period. Um, I do want to underscore that, you know, critically important, Iran will continue to implement its comprehensive safeguards agreement. And that's an agreement that's required by the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty. And it does give inspectors access to key facilities and sites in Iran where nuclear material is produced and stored. So the agency will still be able to determine that all of Iran's nuclear material is in peaceful purposes. So between the CSA and this technical agreement that Iran and the IAEA reached, I think in the short term, you know, we'll stave off a crisis surrounding you know, Iran's nuclear activities and create some political space to restore the JCPOA. But I, I want to emphasize that this is a short term fix. I mean, this loss of monitoring and verification you know, is still concerning. There will still be speculation that Iran is engaged in illicit activities. So I think it's critical now for the United States, Iran, and the other parties to the JCPOA to really accelerate their efforts to restore the agreement. Yeah, let's get into that. You know, for weeks, we have been waiting for the Biden administration to begin taking steps to re-engage diplomatically on this issue. And last week, the administration indicated it was ready to talk with signatories of the Iran deal to discuss re-entry and a return to compliance. But as of now, has not lifted any sanctions. What does all of this mean for the likelihood that the United States will be able to re-enter the JCPOA? Well, the Biden administration continues to say the right things, that they want to restore the JCPOA, that they'll lift sanctions if Iran returns to compliance. And they acknowledge that the Iran deal benefits U.S. national security and nonproliferation interests when it's fully implemented. But I think we're seeing frustration on the Iranian side that the Biden team hasn't moved more quickly to support its rhetoric with concrete actions that signal good faith U.S. intentions to restore the JCPOA. We have seen some positive steps. And just last week, the Biden administration you know, at the U.N. Security Council said that it did not recognize the Trump administration's efforts to snap back U.N. sanctions on Iran that were modified under the resolution that endorsed the deal. Uh, so that certainly is important. The U.S. has also said it's willing to meet with other parties to the JCPOA to, to work on that sequencing. Uh, but I think it's imperative that the Biden administration continue to pair its rhetoric about restoring the deal you know, with concrete actions. I don't think Iran should expect any significant sanctions relief until the process of returning to full implementation is underway. But there are still actions that Biden could take that would reinforce you know, his stated intention to return to the deal. I mean, that could include you know, support for humanitarian trade efforts. I mean, Iran has experienced you know, devastating impact of, of COVID and has been unable to use some of the humanitarian you know, carve outs that have sensibly exist in, in, in U.S. sanctions. So I think the U.S. could really ease the path for, for trade there. I mean, another, I think, common sense step for the Biden administration to take would be to waive sanctions on certain non-proliferation projects that are outlined in the JCPOA. And the implementation of these projects benefits U.S. security and non-proliferation interests. It allows other parties to the deal to fulfill their obligations under the agreement to work with Iran on some of these projects. And it can facilitate Iran's uh, return to compliance with the JCPOA. And by these projects, I mean, you know, modifying the unfinished heavy water reactor at Iraq to a more proliferation resistant model 
And then you know, easing the way for Iran to ship out enriched uranium and, and, and heavy water. So these are some common sense steps that I think you know the Biden administration could take that would demonstrate that there's momentum behind these statements that that Biden has made about wanting to restore the JCPOA. But I'm just worried that you know both sides will continue you know their their positive rhetoric about about the JCPOA but we won't see you know them taking advantage of the momentum gained and the time bought by this Iran IAEA agreement uh, to really start that process and to begin coordinating the necessary steps to return to compliance and with our final 30 seconds is there anything specific that you would want to see from the rest of the P5 plus one and Iran um, if they want to see a revitalized JCPOA? Well, I think we shouldn't forget that the European Union is still the convener of the parties that have negotiated with Iran. And I think a critical step that the EU could take would be to call a meeting between all of the parties to the JCPOA and the United States to really begin t- the technical talks about coordinating this return to compliance with the JCPOA. I mean, the, the EU, I think, has been recognized by both the United States and Iran as possibly taking on this role. And if the EU, I think, you know, seizes this moment, you know, holds a meeting, encourages all of the parties to attend, that could be a positive way for jumpstarting the process, detailing, you know, the technical steps that need to be taken by both sides and ensuring that they're done in a coordinated manner. So both the United States and Iran, you know, feel that the, the, the restoration of the JCPOA is done in a manner consistent with their internal political demands. Kelsey... Seven minutes goes by far too fast. Thank you so much for joining. Thanks for having me. Hi, my name is Elizabeth Warner, and I'm the managing director of Plowshares Fund. Even though I've been working in the nuclear field for nearly nine years, there is still so much to learn. That's why I'm a dedicated listener of Press the Button. I so appreciate each episode where I can get the top stories of the week and a deeper dive into critical conversations with thought leaders and experts in nuclear policy and national security. I'm also a proud supporter of Plowshares Fund. Did you know that many of the guests featured on Press the Button are supported by Plowshares Fund? Since our founding 40 years ago, all of our work is made possible by individuals just like you. Curious, committed, passionate, If you like what you're hearing on Press the Button and want to support the work of Plowshares Fund, please donate today. Whether it's $5, $50, or $500, your generosity helps create a safer future, free from the threat of nuclear weapons. Visit plowshares.org today to make a donation. Or join me and make it monthly. Whatever you do, stay informed, stay safe, and stay connected. Together, we can create a world where nuclear weapons can never be used again. Thank you for listening. As many of our listeners are aware, George Shultz passed away earlier this month at the age of 100. He held cabinet-level positions in the Nixon administration before serving as Secretary of State under President Ronald Reagan. Secretary Schultz was a monumental figure at the end of the Cold War and played a vital role in helping President Reagan wind down the nuclear arms race, enabling both nations to step back from the nuclear brink. And some would say his influence has been underappreciated. To help us go through Schultz's many achievements and his legacy, I'm here with Philip Taubman, a journalist and editor who spent three decades at The New York Times and is currently writing a biography on George Schultz. I should also mention that we here at Plowshares are fortunate to have Phil on our board. Phil, welcome to the show. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Phil, earlier this month, you wrote an op-ed for the New York Times in which you included this quote from Mikhail Gorbachev, the last leader of the Soviet Union, who said, without Reagan, the Cold War would not have ended. But without Schultz, Reagan would not have ended the Cold War. What do you think Gorbachev meant by this claim, and how should we understand it? I think you have to look at it at two levels, Tom. Uh, The first uh, is from Gorbachev's perspective as one of four people uh, involved in winding down the Cold War, 
It was Gorbachev, the Soviet leader, uh, his foreign minister, Edward Shevardnadze, and on the American side, President Reagan and George Shultz, Secretary of State. So from Gorbachev's perspective, uh, Shultz loomed large because I think he understood that Reagan had aspirations to wind down the Cold War, uh, but had boxed himself in uh, with a lot of belligerent rhetoric uh, during the first years of his presidency. Uh, and there had been almost no uh, meaningful diplomatic progress between Washington and Moscow during uh, Reagan's first term, which you know ran from uh, 81 to the election again in 84 when he was reelected. And so I think Gorbachev, who took power in, in early 85, uh, quickly came to realize that uh, Schultz was essentially the indispensable man, the person who translated Reagan's impulses, his kind of uh, gentler impulses uh, into a strategy uh, of trying to wind down the Cold War and then uh, actually into negotiations that Schultz conducted both with Gorbachev and, and with Shevardnadze. The second dimension, which I think Gorbachev probably intuited, but wasn't really familiar with, and which I have uh, delved into deeply in working on this uh, biography project, is the opposition that existed around Reagan uh, among his senior aides to trying to ease East-West tensions. Uh, and looking back on that period, what you, what you see is a president uh, who, as I said, uh, you know, was belligerent in his rhetoric, adopted tough policies, uh, but also uh, found himself uh, with a defense secretary, a CIA director, a national security advisor, uh, UN ambassador, and others, all of whom were determined not to ease East-West tensions. Uh, and it was really the resilience and determination, and patience, perseverance of Schultz that helped Reagan move uh, from this corner that he had uh, boxed himself into to a position where when Gorbachev became Soviet leader, it was possible uh, to try to have the kinds of negotiations that uh, eventually were successful. Now, one of the first steps um, Reagan and Gorbachev took together in dismantling the Cold War came in 1985 when they issued a joint declaration, uh, an important principle that said a nuclear war cannot be won and must never be fought. How important to you was that statement and what role did Schultz play in it? It's interesting when you go back and look at the press coverage of that statement, which was issued by the two leaders uh, at their first summit meeting in Geneva in late 1985, it actually got uh, very limited uh, coverage. Uh, and I think that was because presidents dating back to Truman, uh, really all American presidents uh, in the nuclear age, uh, had uh, rhetorically uh, said that they wanted to reduce the nuclear threat and even abolish nuclear weapons, but they never really acted on it and they had never really committed themselves to doing that. So uh, when you get Gorbachev and Reagan issuing that statement in, in Geneva, uh, it was kind of a resounding uh, reaffirmation of an absolutely critical principle. Schultz realized how important it was at the time. Uh, and, uh, you know, in subsequent years, he would often talk about it as the first of a series of turning points uh, uh, between Reagan and, uh, and Gorbachev that led to the easing of uh, Cold War tensions. But, you know, it's fascinating when you look back at it uh, in the press coverage, did not get a lot of attention. Now, of course, they went on uh, to, to do even more. In, in 1986, um, the very next year at the Reykjavik summit in Iceland, the two nations came closer to an agreement to eliminate all nuclear weapons uh, than any time before or since. Um, and it's long enough ago now that many people probably don't uh, remember it or, or may have forgotten it, but, but it was an important moment in history. 
Reagan asked Gorbachev if he would support the elimination of all nuclear explosive devices, and Gorbachev agreed. And to that, Schultz said, then let's do it. Uh, of course, this was a fleeting opportunity as, as the deal was undone by Reagan's misplaced belief in ballistic missile defense. But how did Schultz view this moment at the time? And again, what was his specific role? So you got to back up and look at the backdrop uh, to Reykjavik. So, uh, you know, prior to that, uh, Reagan, uh, early on in his uh, first term, had uh, unveiled this strategic defense initiative, which was this missile defense shield that uh, some scientists had uh, dreamed up that was uh, technologically totally unfeasible. Uh, but Reagan liked the idea uh, because it appealed to his sense that you could do, you know, one sort of single thing that would eliminate the risk of nuclear war. So you're coming into Reykjavik with Reagan firmly committed to continuing research uh, on what became known colloquially as the Star Wars, the missile shield in space. And you have to remember that the Reykjavik summit was a snap summit. It was not a summit that had been carefully choreographed in advance. Uh, it, it developed spontaneously. Uh, and the Americans, uh, before they headed to Reykjavik, thought it was merely going to be a, a holding moment uh, to try to set a date for Gorbachev to come to Washington for the first time. So they get to Reykjavik and they're stunned to discover that uh, Gorbachev has arrived uh, with a briefcase full of huge, ambitious proposals. Uh, and so the two leaders and their two foreign ministers assembled in this uh, little seaside uh, house in Reykjavik, you know, overlooking the ocean uh, in a small room. It was just the four of them, uh, plus uh, translators and note takers. So there are, you know, no real advisors in the room uh, with them. And they launch into discussions, which, as you indicated, led to this extraordinary moment uh, on the second day where they actually uh, talked fleetingly about eliminating all nuclear weapons. Uh, that idea collapsed uh, fairly quickly because Reagan uh, was not willing to compromise on Star Wars. Gorbachev had proposed at the meeting uh, actually a, a fairly novel and potentially uh, common ground proposal uh, in which the Soviet Union would not object if the United States pursued laboratory, quote unquote, research on the Star Wars plan for 10 years. And Reagan said no. Uh, at one point, he passed a note uh, across the table to Schultz saying, uh, essentially, uh, am I right? And Schultz leaned over and whispered, yes, you are. So the talks broke down. Uh, even though in retrospect, this was a, critically, a critical turning point, uh, which we can talk about if, if you'd like, but just to complete the thought about Schultz's role uh, there. Later, I asked him, uh, you know, did he have any regrets about the unwillingness of uh, Reagan to compromise on, on Star Wars? And he had a wistful look uh, when I was talking to him, and his answer was essentially, I wish we had asked Gorbachev what he meant by laboratory. Uh, did he mean a small room somewhere or did he have a more expansive vision of what laboratory, uh, the definition of laboratory? And I think if, if they had gone down that road and explored that question, they might have found that laboratory was a term that would allow them to come to agreement. Hmm. Fascinating. And of course, you know, so many years have now passed since that moment, and we've never been uh, in a moment quite like that again. So it makes you realize uh, how rare and fleeting these moments um, these moments really are. Well, well, skipping ahead a little bit, in 2007, uh, Schultz, now out of government, gets together with former Secretary of State Henry Kissinger, former Secretary of Defense William J. Perry, who is uh, who is who who comes on this show quite a bit, and Senator Sam Nunn, 
Uh, and they publish a remarkable Wall Street Journal op-ed in which they call for a world free of nuclear weapons. Can you explain Schultz's role here and uh, what you think they were trying to do? So it involves a fifth person uh, who did not get as much attention, but was uh, included in a book I did actually on this effort uh, by the five men. And the fifth person was Sid Drell. Drell was a, a, a longtime uh, physicist at Stanford who had spent a lifetime consulting on technical intelligence collection issues, uh, going back really to the Eisenhower presidency. And when George Shultz retired as Secretary of State, he moved out to Stanford where he had taught earlier and had a home on campus. And he met uh, Sidrell for the first time uh, and they really clicked together, the physicist and the, and the, and the statesman. Uh, and I think it was their uh, conversations about the danger of nuclear weapons that crystallized for Schultz the importance of trying to do something. So then uh, that led to uh, the involvement of Perry, uh, who agreed and also happened to be based conveniently at Stanford. Uh, so Drell and Schultz and Perry could confer. Uh, and then they brought in Kissinger, uh, you know, who was willing to support the initiative, although I think uh, he had uh, some reservations about it, but he certainly lent his name to it. Uh, and uh, lastly, and, and very importantly, Sam Nunn, uh, the former uh, chairman of the Senate Armed Services Committee. And so what made it important in some ways was it, it was a bipartisan or uh, a political effort. You had two Democrats, uh, you had Nunn and Perry and two Republicans uh, in Kissinger and Schultz uh, uh, leading the effort. So, you know, for Schultz, it became the passion of his retirement years. He really threw himself into it uh, with a dedication uh, that I think surprised a lot of his Republican friends who didn't necessarily share that view. And they pushed the initiative. Uh, their timing proved to be great initially because uh, Barack Obama became president and he embraced the, the same uh, uh, goal of eliminating nuclear weapons. He went to Prague uh, in April of 2009 and delivered a sensational speech calling for the abolition of nuclear weapons. He then chaired a Security Council meeting at the UN in September of 2009, in which all 15 uh, members unanimously supported the idea of abolishing nuclear weapons in a resolution. However, sadly, the sort of uh, uh, steam ran out of this over the course of the Obama presidency, and uh, it, uh, it kind of stalled out. What are your thoughts on, on maybe what went wrong there? And do you think Schultz had any thoughts on what could have been done to move that agenda forward uh, more successfully? Well, I think in retrospect, uh, there were a couple of factors uh, that were responsible uh, number one, I think there was insufficient attention uh, at the highest levels of the Obama administration to putting people in critical jobs at the Defense Department, uh, at the Energy Department, which really supervises the, uh, uh, the national labs where uh, uh, research and development is done of nuclear weapons, uh, and at the White House itself. So as Obama embraced this very idea that aides who reported to him across the government were less enthusiastic about it at the Defense Department, the Energy Department. And so when they went through a nuclear posture review, uh, which is an effort uh, quadrennially usually to uh, sort of take stock of America's nuclear arsenal and nuclear policies, uh, the, the nuclear posture review didn't yield the results that were consistent with Obama's speech at Prague. So that was one reason. And I think uh, clearly related to that was that Obama was distracted by other uh, issues, threw himself into, understandably, into the effort to pass the Affordable Care Act, uh, and I think uh, his own commitment to nuclear abolition, uh, I don't know that it, it, uh, it sagged personally with him. I just don't know. But it, clearly the time 
and energy that he was prepared to invest in it and political capital that he was prepared to invest in it receded over time. I think all, all five men were disappointed by what happened. Uh, the, the kind of air uh, came out of their effort. Uh, and, uh, you know, they could never really pump uh, uh, new life into it. Uh, and certainly once Trump became president, uh, the, the goal seemed to be uh, impossible. Now, um, going back to the Times op-ed you published not long ago, uh, you ended that op-ed with this quote. George Shultz was the last of the post-war statesmen who served in combat during World War II. He was not an infallible or flawless person, but his kindness combined with his common sense and pragmatic approach to solving problems ought to be an example for our discordant time. Can you tell us more about the kind of person that Schultz was? So I think the key to understanding George Schultz was uh, that he was uh, came out of an academic background. Uh, he had uh, uh, gotten a PhD in economics at MIT. He was dean of the uh, business school at the University of Chicago. He spent uh, you know, more than a decade uh, as a professor and dean. And in that role, uh, he developed the custom of listening uh, very patiently to people. He developed the custom of reading deeply into history. Uh, he developed the custom of looking for common ground uh, to resolve differences. And uh, his specialty in economics uh, was the labor market. and. Uh, 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 labor management disputes. And as a student of those, he came to see, I think, in a very important principle that he would often talk about later, which was if you put uh, dueling parties in a room arguing over principle, they will never come to an agreement. But if you put them in the room with those same issues and pose them as a problem to solve, they will solve the problem. Uh, and I think to George Shultz, the Cold War was a problem to solve. Uh, and he approached it in a very deliberate, calm, reasonable way. Uh, and I think those were the factors that uh, allowed him to be so successful. I'm also struck by the fact that while he was serving in the Nixon and Reagan administrations, um, there was two major crises going on, of course, uh, and many, but, but, but the two that come to mind are, are Watergate and the Iran-Contra scandal. And he seemed to get through both of those unscathed. Is there a story there about how he managed to do that? And, and, and does that speak to his character? Well, less scathed, actually, than most people know. <clears throat> uh, and uh, I get into that in my book. I, I'm reluctant to kind of uh, lift the curtain on that research at the moment. Uh, but the bottom line is that he, he behaved with great honor uh, in both cases. Uh, on the uh, 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 Watergate side, there was an effort by the White House uh, to uh, get the in Internal Revenue Service, which he supervised as Treasury Secretary, to uh, go after a list of uh, Nixon opponents, the so-called uh, Nixon enemies list. Uh, and the White House pressed the IRS and Treasury to do that, and Schultz uh, refused. Uh, there's another chapter to that story that I tell in the book uh, that isn't quite as uh, uh, uplifting. Uh, and then uh, on Iran-Contra, uh, he is uh, famously known and correctly known for opposing uh, the Iran-Contra uh, operation, the parts of it that he knew about, uh, which was mainly the uh, effort to, to provide uh, arms uh, to Iran in exchange for hostages. Uh, and he did not know about the diversion of profits from those sales to the Contras in, in uh, Nicaragua. And of course, when he heard about that, he opposed it too. But the story there is, is also a bit more complex. Uh, and uh, he did the right thing in opposing it, uh, but uh, he uh, probably stopped short of what he could have done to end it. Phil, as you... Um finish up your biography of Schultz, did you find anything in your research that surprised you about him and anything that strays from the standard narrative uh, or that we don't talk about when we talk about his legacy? 
Well, I think his uh, work as labor secretary in the Nixon administration has largely gone unnoted. Uh, and the uh, distinctive thing that he did in that job for which he deserves enormous credit uh, and never really got it uh, uh, in publicly at least, is that Nixon launched an effort uh, to desegregate uh, Southern urban school systems in the United States. This was done in light of Supreme Court rulings, uh, including the Brown v. Board of Education ruling and later rulings that specifically instructed uh, that uh, desegregation of Southern schools proceed with alacrity. So Nixon appointed a task force to see that this be done. He had mixed feelings himself because he had uh, run successfully for president uh, with a so-called Southern strategy that emphasized trying to allure uh, Southern Democrats, uh, many of whom were uh, not sympathetic to, to desegregation. And he had appealed to them in, in sort of so subtle and not so subtle kind of racist terms. So Nixon had mixed feelings about this, but he was also a lawyer and wanted to uh, follow this, the edicts of the Supreme Court. So uh, Spiro Agnew, the vice president, was put in charge of this task force, and he soon checked out because he wanted nothing to do with desegregation. And Schultz then led it, and it was quite remarkable uh, over the course of the time they worked on this, the percentage of Southern schools that were desegregated went from about 15 to 20 percent to 70 percent. Uh, and it was largely due to the patient uh, negotiations that George Schultz supervised. Well, Phil, thank you for giving us that additional fascinating uh, history. It's great to see other dimensions to these historical characters uh, where in our line of work, we, we tend to hear only one part of it. And uh, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. But I want to thank you uh, so much for coming on. And of course, when your book comes out, we will look forward so much to reading it. And thank you again for being here today. My pleasure. And now for everyone's favorite nuclear Q&A. Are you ready, Tom? Bring it on, Michelle. This week's question comes from Hobbs in Florida. Hobbs asks, if Iran gets the bomb, won't everyone else in the region who doesn't have one follow? How do we stop that from happening? Thank you, Michelle. And thank you, Hobbs in Florida for that great question. Um, first, we need to back up a, a little bit and go back uh, about 50 years in time. Actually, Israel was the first country to introduce nuclear weapons into the Middle East. Uh, and they have been there since 1967. And that has led other countries like Iran, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, Libya, and Syria to explore their options as well. Uh, and of course, there is now in increased concern that if Iran gets the bomb, uh, Saudi Arabia in particular uh, would follow and, and maybe others. So to the question of how to stop it, um, you know, the first thing we need to do is get back in the Iran nuclear deal, which the United States, Iran, and our European partners are working on uh, right now and was covered in the early warning segment of this show. Um, so that's step one. Uh, if we get that done, um, then we need to think about ways to go beyond the Iran nuclear deal. Uh, for example, expanding the limitations um, on uh, nuclear programs in Iran to other countries in the Middle East, uh, or even going beyond those limitations. For example, rather than limiting countries um, to just low and rich uranium, from a non-proliferation perspective, it would be better to ban all uranium enrichment or to ban all plutonium reprocessing. Uh, in the Middle East. Uh, harder to do, but if you can do it, more effective. Uh, next, it would be great to have a ban on nuclear testing in the Middle East. Um, the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty is a treaty well known to our listeners, um, but that treaty cannot go into force without Israel, Iran, and Egypt uh, ratifying it. So we need support of those countries um, in the Middle East for Test Ban Treaty. Uh, we also would like a chemical weapons ban in the Middle East. Of course, there's an international treaty, the CWC. Uh, Egypt and Israel are holdouts, and Syria is in violation. 
Uh, so here again, we need to we need to get cooperation from countries in the Middle East. We would also need to get control on uh, missile programs in the region. So some regional missile limitations would be great. And and ultimately, we want to try to um, tie all this up into something like a weapons of mass destruction free zone in the Middle East. Uh, it's going to be very difficult to just eliminate one weapon of mass destruction at the time, uh, rather than going just after nuclear or chem. Uh, to achieve, it would be, I think, more practical, uh, more likely, uh, although still hard, to achieve a WMD free zone. In the Middle East, this is a goal supported by the United Nations, has been for many years, uh, unfortunately making little progress, but, um, but we remain hopeful. Um, so step one, save the Iran nuclear deal, uh, replace the constraints on Iran's uh, nuclear program that were so effective uh, coming out of the Obama administration. Uh, if we get that job done, then we can go on and expand those constraints um, through the region. Another week, another question. Thanks, Tom. And thank you, Hops. And remember, if you want your question answered on the air, shoot us a DM at press button pod or send us an email at press the button at plowshares.org. Thanks for listening to Press the Button. This podcast is produced by Delphine Vigil, Zach Brown, Derek Zender, and Will Lowry. Sound design by Derek Zender. Audio engineering by Derek Zender and Will Lowry. Our theme song is by Lyrics Born and the Poets of Rhythm, sampled with kind permission. Additional music by San Francisco-based bands 17 Evergreen and the Society of Rockets. To continue the dialogue and support our work, visit plowshares.org. <laughs>